Okay, let's get started. I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar in honor of World COPD Awareness Month. Let's talk about COP, bronchiac COPD, bronchiectasis, and NTM lung disease. I'm Amy Liepman, president of NTM and Bone Research, and I will be your moderator today. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Diego Maselli from UT Health at San Antonio. Dr. Maselli is a professor of medicine and chief of the Division of Pulmonary Diseases and Critical Care Medicine at UT Health San Antonio in San Antonio, Texas. In addition, he is medical director of respiratory care and the severe asthma program at U University Health System in San Antonio. Originally, originally from Guatemala City, where he had earned his medical degree, Dr. Maselli completed a residency in internal medicine at the University of Texas in Houston. He subsequently completed a fellowship in pulmonary diseases and critical care at UT Health San Antonio and has remained there as a member of the faculty. His research is focused on severe asthma, non-CF bronchiectasis, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So for today's webinar, um, during the presentation, you can type your questions into the Q&A box. Um, you can, you just type it in and then you hit send. You can also, if you want to ask the question anonymously, you hit the checkbox that says send anonymously. After Dr. Maselli has completed his presentation, we will start going through the Q&A and reading out the questions so Dr. Maselli can answer them. Uh, don't forget to follow us on social media. We, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. We all archive all of our presentations on YouTube, and you can also find us on the app formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> Dr. Maselli, welcome. Thank you. I give you the floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Amy. Give me just one second and I'll share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Amy, for that introduction. That's very kind of you. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining uh, us today to talk a little bit about COPD, bronchiectasis, and NTM. Uh, it's really an honor for me to participate in this activity and to be um, helping the COPD Foundation. It's really a privilege to be invited to to be with you guys today. And again, thank you so much for joining. I am uh, here in San Antonio, Texas, as Amy mentioned. Uh, and over the past decade or so, uh, I really focused a lot of my work on, on obstructive pulmonary diseases, uh, COPD, uh, bronchiectasis and asthma, and also some NTM disease as well. And uh, today we're gonna be discussing some of these um, diseases. We're gonna talk about them initially individually, but also um, later on we'll be discussing things, uh, how, what are the similarities, how do they influence each other, and some of the things that we have to look out um, when we have a patient that has uh, this diseases, when we have this disease, or a family member may have this disease. Um, so again, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for joining me today. I have some disclosures. I am a consultant and a speaker uh, for a couple of pharmaceutical companies listed there. And I also have received research funding uh, from NIH and the Gates Foundation, and particularly from the COPD Foundation. The relevant interest, uh, conflict of interest I have is I'm one of the uh, investigators for the bronchiectasis and NTM uh, research registry and also for from the COPD gene study, which are partially uh, supported by the COPD Foundation. So, um, Let's start. Let's talk a little bit about uh, COPD. And so, first of all, why is it so important for us to have this COPD Awareness Month? And why is it that we're together here uh, talking about COPD? Why is it such a relevant disease? Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm a pulmonologist, so I'm a little biased towards it. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a very, very important disease in the United States. It's one of the most common chronic diseases out there, and it really affects a lot of people. Um, we think that it affects around 16 million people in the United States, and this is based on data that comes from the CDC and other um, organizations. But what is interesting is that that's what we know for sure. 
there is a lot of patients out there, we think, and we estimate that there's a lot of patients out there that have COPD and unfortunately have not yet been diagnosed. There are some estimates out there that around 8 million people in the United States have COPD and they just know it, or they may suspect it but have not seen a provider yet or someone that can help them by doing spirometry and confirming that diagnosis of COPD. So the numbers that we have is around 16 million, but really likely is more than that, close to 25 million people. Um, and some of them are underdiagnosed, as I mentioned before. It's very important also because it's a very um, uh, high, uh, has a high likelihood of death. And as you can see, it's the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. And, and, it, and that's really staggering. It's really a disease that has significant implications. And you can see in the bottom of, this, of the slide some of the implications. Really, it's a costly, costly disease. Around $550 billion um, dollars are, are thought to be related to COPD um, every year that we spend on it. This may be related to uh, the medications that the patients take. This may be related to ER visits, hospitalizations. But very importantly, some of these patients miss work. Um, and obviously the productivity comes down, so that's also factored in. As you can imagine, I already mentioned, these patients unfortunately not only use medications, but go to the hospital often. For example, you can see the amount of ER visits. It's 1.3 million um, visits related to COPD every year. That's roughly like a couple of um, visits every minute in the United States or just for COPD. So it is definitely has important implications. Unfortunately, a proportion of these patients after they go to the ER, they get admitted and around half a million people get hospitalized for COPD. And some of these patients unfortunately um, succumb to the disease, uh, end up in the ICU and unfortunately may pass away from the disease. So it is very, very important. It is not surprising that we have a whole month of awareness just to increase um, the awareness in the community, in their medical communities, and everywhere else about how important this disease can be. Now, very briefly, because we have to talk about what it really means to have COPD and what does it mean, the word COPD, what does it mean? COPD is stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And, and chronic because we know that this disease lasts for a long time. It is permanent. It's, it takes many months to, de to develop, many years to develop. And unfortunately, it's a permanent disease. We call it obstructed because there's obstruction in the airways, meaning that there is no, there's difficulty for the air to flow through the airways. So there's limitation for that air, free air movement and um, pulmonary because it's in the lungs. And obviously disease because it can cause a lot of problems in our patients and affect their day-to-day um, -day living. And then this is what we call chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now, we're thinking about COPD. We have to think about who potentially might be at risk for developing uh, this disease or who do we need to be kind of suspicious about it. Um, we see here some of the risk factors for COPD. By far the most important one, at least in the United States, continues to be smoking. The vast majority of our patients with COPD, unfortunately, are uh, previous or current smokers. Um, but what is interesting is that we now are experiencing an interesting phenomenon that people are smoking a little bit less than in previous decades, which is fantastic. There's still a lot of people still smoke, but there is still um, less, which is fortunate. But we also have identified that beyond smoking, there's other things that can be associated with COPD. This includes pollution and other chemicals and exposures to the environment. Um, we're still trying to understand who are these uh, patients that may potentially develop COPD without smoking. At least in the United States, patients that, let's say, for example, work close to highways or are related to the significant smoke exposure, uh, bus drivers, airplane mechanics, and some of these uh, uh, exposures can be linked to COPD. Outside the United States, um, there are uh, certain communities, particularly in Latin America, some in India and Africa, where they would use burning, burn, burn, uh, wood burning stoves 
and they produce uh, a lot of smoke indoors. And this exposure, we call that biomass exposure, has also been linked to COPD. And here in San Antonio, for example, we do get uh, um, some immigrants from uh, Mexico and from Central America. And uh, it's very interesting that these are ladies that have been exposed to um, these stoves for a long time in their houses, in their kitchens, and uh, they never smoke, but nevertheless have COPD. In addition to these exposures, we also understand that age is important. So you do need certain amount of time to develop COPD. So the majority of our patients that have COPD typically have uh, at the age of 40 or older. In addition, um, there are some genetic uh, predisposition or uh, genetic determinants to uh, develop um, COPD. The most uh, studied and the most clearly identified is the alpha-1 and the trypsin deficiency. This enzyme prevents inflammation in, in the lung. And when we have a deficit or a deficiency in this enzyme, which is a genetic problem, then we can see the development of emphysema and also uh, uh, problems in the liver. And patients that have chronic bronchitis or recurrent infections potentially have also the risk of developing this COPD. We still need to do a lot of work about understanding who's at risk. A common question that we get is, why is it that my grandpa or my uncle smoked for like, I don't know, 80 years and they never had any problems with the lungs? And why is it that some patients smoke for 10 years and they have significant um, decline in the lung function? We still don't know why that is. Um, we participate here in San Antonio, and again, with the collaboration of the COPD Foundation on the COPD gene study that was designed to the to identify this determinants of genetic determinants of why uh, COPD happens in some patients and some others it doesn't. Um, and there's still ongoing research to try to identify what genes potentially um, may put you at risk of having COPD. But there's a lot of work to be done. and We've had some answers, but still, again, um, we still need to look into this. But this is kind of like what we know about the risk factors uh, for our patients with COPD. Now, there's two important concepts for patients that have COPD uh, about how the disease develops and how it manifests. So here we have the two major, most important concepts. The first one's emphysema, and the other one is chronic bronchitis. So Emphysema, really, it, it's a pathological description uh, of what happens to the lung after the patients get exposed to significant um, irritants or smoke, for example. And what happens is that with time, the ex uh, chronic exposure in the airways, particularly, and here we see the picture of the alveoli, which are the terminal sacs at the end of the airways. This is where the gas exchange happens. This is where oxygen goes, comes through the airways into these alve alveolar or sacs, and it's transmitted into the blood supply and distributed to the rest of the body. And for, again, reasons that we're still trying to understand, this chronic exposure will start to damage very slowly initially, but damage the, the linings of these sacs, and eventually they, there will be destruction and these kind of coalesce in spaces where there's just air. They just become kind of widened spaces where used to be a lot of little sacs, and now you just have one single structure, that, and that's what we call the emphysema. As you can imagine, if you destroy the functional unit of the lung, which is the alveoli, with time, that destruction will lead to a decrease in the efficiency of the lung, of getting that oxygen into the body. And that's why the patients start to develop uh, shortness of breath. Um, it's really disruptive when it's over time and it, it happens obviously in both lungs and um, that leads to the symptoms of shortness of breath. So that's one important component of COPD, again, emphysema. The other component is chronic bronchitis. And this is happens a little bit higher in the airways. So in the Mid, medium to smaller airways. And this is inflammation of the airways 
that is thought again due to exposure chronically to different irritants in the airways such as smoke and with time these airways develop inflammation and also they have an increase in production of mucus so you can see there in the in this in the picture of the slide you can see a normal airway a normal bronchus and um, a, a bronchus that has bronch chronic bronchitis it becomes narrowed um, there's mucus production there's inflammation and that limits the movement of air as well and that's why patients may have wheezing or chest tightness and if you already have both emphysema and chronic bronchitis you have these double effect and that's why patients have these uh, respiratory symptoms it's very interesting again we still need to understand some of these things but there are patients that have predominantly emphysema there are patients that have predominantly chronic bronchitis but the majority of patients have a combination of both maybe a little bit of more emphysema or maybe a little bit of more mucus production but in or bronchitis um, but in the end these two components typically happen um, at the same time and that's the importance of addressing both things um, together now, when do we suspect someone has um, uh, COPD? We talked about some of the risk factors. So definitely if someone has respiratory symptoms and they are, have a known history of smoking, we should definitely suspect COPD. And these are some of the classical features of patients that have COPD. You have patients that have chronic cough, recurrent infections, recurrent episodes of bronchitis and infections, we already talked about the chest tightness, so wheezing and tightness, shortness of breath, and they may also go to the hospital because of these infections, or sometimes we call these kind of lung attacks or exacerbations, and these may happen, unfortunately, uh, recurrently. So patients go back and forth to the hospital uh, where they had to receive antibiotic and steroids to bring down the, that inflammation that happens in these very acute settings. I'll spend a little bit more time on the fat fatigue and fatigue is important because sometimes it's a little bit more subtle and the patients will tell me, you know, um, I used to mow the lawn. Now it takes me, you know, instead of 30 minutes, now it takes, you know, two hours. And I thought it was just because I was getting old. You know, uh, I would go up the stairs, but now I have to stop and. Uh, middle of the middle of the flight the stairs and kind of catch my breath but i think that's because i'm old uh, i used to walk with my friends and so you get the picture right it's it starts subtle and that's why it's so important when we are seeing patients or talking to our family member or uh, other patients that we suspect that they have copd is to ask them you know is is, is the fatigue really because i'm older or is it because something else is happening and, um, you know, someone, even if you're 80 or 90 or 100, uh, you should still be able to um, function well without really getting uh, shorter breath. And so particularly with this kind of rapid decline, we should definitely suspect that something is happening. The same with chronic cough. Chronic cough is another, another symptom that sometimes our patients will say, well, you know, I thought that it's just because I smoke, I have this chronic cough, but we have to be very be careful we're not missing on someone that may have COPD and and it's important not only to treat it but also to prevent the progression of the disease and sometimes we have these medications and things that we can do for our patients that can be helpful so these are some of the features that we use to suspect um, COPD now how do we make that diagnosis this is extremely important if we suspect that someone in our family member or us or a patient has um, COPD, we have to ask the question, can we confirm this diagnosis? And the diagnosis is confirmed with spirometry, so pulmonary function testing, but in particular, spirometry is the gold standard for the diagnosis of um, COPD. It's very important. Nowadays, which is this very fortunately, uh, very fortunate that we have technology, smaller devices, easier to do, now the new uh, spirometers can connect to the phone, to the iPhone or to your Android phone, and they can connect and provide a lot of information. It used to be a very expensive test. Now it's very, very cheap. 
um, and can be done by virtually anyone. Um, so it's readily available. So we can identify uh, who has um, COPD. The way we, when we read the COPD, there's certain the, read the spirometry. There's certain features um, in the in the spirometry in the function of the, lung, the lungs that we see in the numbers, the curves and things that we can actually make the diagnosis of um, COPD relatively easily. And importantly, we can also monitor through time what has happened. So we can do spirometry, let's say one uh, one day, and then wait another year or six months and see what has happened to um, to the patient. So it, it is very easy, non-invasive, doesn't hurt, and relatively inexpensive uh, and more widely available. So there's really no excuses of why we shouldn't really do um, spirometry in patients that we suspect have COPD. Now, there's been some questions out there about should we do spirometry on everyone? So far, the data suggests that doing that approach is not very cost-effective. But in those patients that have respiratory symptoms and potentially exposure is definitely an important thing to do to make sure that we miss COPD. Now, we can also do CTs of the chest and x-rays and things. And there's a lot of growing interest in the applications of CAT scans. Here we can see a CAT scan of a patient that has advanced COPD. And, uh, you know, we can make the diagnosis of uh, COPD with a, with a CAT scan. Um, but again, the gold standard continues to be um, continues to be a spirometry. There's ongoing research about this specifically, and from COPD gene, uh, we're trying to use some of these techniques like a CAT scan and other things to better define COPD, to redefine COPD, and also to be more uh, kind of more elegant with regards to risk prognostication, so get better prognosis and more information to the patients when we see, for example, in this case, emphysema in, in the CAT scan. So here, just to very briefly, I'll mention here in the middle, you can see um, the heart, but surrounded by the lung, which you can see some areas of darker and gray, different shades of gray and dark. And those those areas in the darker are areas that where the lung has been really replaced with air. So these are just advanced emphysema um, in a patient. This patient we just saw actually a couple of a couple of days here in San Antonio in our clinic. What's the treatment for COPD? This you might be very familiar with. Really, we use a lot of inhaled therapies. We focus a lot, a lot on bronchodilators to have that maximal bronchodilator to try to open up the airway so that patients can breathe better. We focus a lot on that. And for those patients that have either frequent exacerbations or those that have different inflammation, particularly with eosinophils, which is a cell that tells us what type of inflammation the patient may have, we sometimes use inhaled corticosteroids. You can see the big no more smoking sign there. We really focus a lot on trying to decrease the risk of progression of the disease. And studies have shown very eloquently and very elegantly that when we stop smoking, not only we stop the progression of the disease, but actually we decrease the risk of mortality. So smoking cessation is extremely important. It's paramount when it becomes, um, when we see a patient with COPD. I spend a lot of time talking to patients, trying to provide alternatives and counseling to try to decrease the amount of exposure that they may have. Uh, this is, a, a, I cannot stress this enough of how important smoking cessation is. As you can imagine, COPD is just one of the many things that um, smoking can cause or can affect. There's the risk of cancer, heart, um, strokes, and many, many other things that when we stop smoking, uh, it's really going to be beneficial for our patients. For those patients that have advanced COPD, we have options for them as well beyond the inhalers. We have some oral medications to try to treat those that have frequent exacerbations. There's newer te techniques uh, and um, therapies, including endobronchial valves that are uh, placed with uh, a bronchoscope. So endoscopically, we place endobronchial valves to try to improve the movement of air in the lung. Pulmonary rehabilitation continues to be very important in our patients that have advanced uh, lung conditions, including COPD. And the same 
with transplant is our last resort, but it is available for our patients that are not responding to therapy or that really have really advanced disease. And that's also available. Here in San Antonio, we had a great success with our lung transplant program, um, helping our patients with COPD um, have a, a new chance in, in uh, you know, improving their quality of life and improvements in overall symptoms. Um, so this is kind of like the treatment of COPD. Now let's shift a little bit of focus. And so we're gonna now talk about bronchiectasis. Um, and bronchiectasis, it's a, a little bit of, a, in this case, a different way of defining this. COPD, you see, is more complex. It has emphysema, chronic bronchitis. Bronchiectasis is something that we see on an X-ray, particularly the CAT scan. That's the kind of like the gold standard is to do a CAT scan of the chest, so computer tomography. And what it is is a dilation, irreversible dilation of the airways. That's... Um, is a damage in the lungs caused by something. We think that likely some initial insult caused inflammation. And in the susceptible uh, patient, this led to this dilation of the airways. There is a change in the architecture, if you will, of the lung. And the airways are just dilated. Some of them can be subtle, but others have can have wide dilations. And the problem with these dilations is that, you know, when we dilate, we also lose different uh, structural components of the airway, particularly the cilia, which are those little hairs that move mucus. And this, um, in addition to that, the, the changes in the airways, these become kind of tortuous and they start to accumulate mucus. And here in the picture, you can see an example of like on the left side, um, the left lung, which is on the right side, um, looks like it's just dilated, it's accumulating uh, mucus there. And that is really the, the problem. As we accumulate mucus, unfortunately, that leads to symptoms, but also may bring also infections. And then it becomes a, a vicious cycle, which we'll talk in, in the next couple of slides. Who is affected by bronchiectasis? Typically, this is a disease that affects older population. Um, it's um, in some of the epidemiological studies, at least in the United States, it appears to affect more uh, women than men in around three to four to one ratio. And we now know also that the incidence of bronchiectasis is also increasing uh, over time. We don't know specifically why that is. Why is it that it's increasing? Uh, perhaps uh, it's... Uh, you know, activities like this increase awareness in both uh, providers and patients and families. Um, but also we now have more availability of a CAT scan for our patients. So then you can actually find out if the patient has bronchiectasis or not. In the past, it used to be like we had a CAT scan in only limited regions, but now the CAT scan is really widely available in the United States. And then finally, there are some authors have um, also sp speculated that um, perhaps some of the medications that we use that affect our immune system may potentially uh, increase the risk of having bronchiectasis, but these are just uh, kind of theories that have not been definitively proven. But we do know that there's more patients out there, and that we know that there's a, probably a lot of patients out there that also remain underdiagnosed. This is just uh, uh, to give you a glimpse of our experience uh, here in San Antonio. This is our, um, uh, our database of patients with bronchiectasis. And so I wanted to show you a little bit about the age. You can see that in this case, the majority of our patients are 60 and older. In fact, our mean age is around 70. And you can see in yellow that it affects mostly our patients that are ladies. Um, and uh, between, you know, like, 58% of them are um, ladies and 42% are men. So kind of consistent what we see in, in the literature across the United States. But again, just to show you that there's kind of like in our community, at least it, it appears to be the same, that it just affects our older patients, particularly our, our, our ladies. Who do we suspect um, that ha may have bronchiectasis? Hmm. So here you see something interesting, like 
does it does this slide doesn't look doesn't look familiar to you already i mean it's very similar actually to copd so these patients will have chronic cough they may have recurrent infections they may have shortness of breath they also go to the hospital with these exacerbations particularly related to action so they require treatment with antibiotics sometimes they have to go to the hospital and stay in the hospital there's a little bit of more component of sputum production definitely is a feature of bronchiectasis but we also had mentioned that in COPD we also see patients that have chronic bronchitis and may also have sputum production so that's something that you know it's important to consider then we see patients their patient actually coughing up blood this is a uh, sometimes we've seen this in patients that have bronchiectasis and what happens is that there's so much inflammation sometimes in the airways that sometimes it affects the vessels sometimes it can actually erode a vessel and patients as a cough may cough up some blood and we call that hemoptysis which is coughing up um, blood um, but the main point I wanted to kind of start thinking you know, for you to start thinking is that these symptoms appear quite similar so cough shortness of breath sputum production and frequent exacerbations meaning going to the hospital often and the shortness of breath so there are definitely some similarities there how do we make the diagnosis of um, bronchiectasis we kind of already mentioned that already it definitely our patients that uh, we suspect bronchiectasis they need a, a ct of the chest to confirm the diagnosis of bronchiectasis and and this is really the gold standard as of now for how we make that diagnosis yes there are times when we do an x-ray that we can suspect it and sometimes the x-rays are very clear actually that this is bronchiectasis but the but really the diagnosis should be um, confirmed with ct of the chest and the ct of the chest um, is able to do so this high resolution study that can actually um, detect many features that are useful when we are trying to understand not only what type of bronchiectasis the patients may have but maybe if they might benefit from specific therapies so i'll show you some cat scans in the next couple of slides so you can see um, uh, and some examples of what we're discussing here so this is actually a cat scan of a young lady we saw here in san antonio a couple of weeks ago initially referred for transplant because the lung function was really really low and when they did the CAT scan, they noted that she has these bronchiectasis. You can see those dilations that she has um, uh, on 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 the on the on the on the, on the CAT scan, and these are multiple particles. Some of them are bigger than others. And I want you to also look at the wall of each of these style, um, areas. Um, they're relatively thin, and the rest of the lung even though it has a little, some squiggly lines here and there, these are the vessels, it's pretty clear otherwise, which is important to consider. So we do see a patient and she has fortunately advanced um, advanced uh, uh, symptoms and shortness of breath. Uh, and this is an example of bronchiectasis at a pretty advanced a, uh, stage. This is a patient also that we saw a couple of weeks ago um, and you can see here again, this is um, some areas of dilation. This is in the right middle lobe right here and the lingula, which is kind of like the left middle portion of the lung. And this is the heart in the middle. And again, I want you to see that it's interesting that there's areas that have these dilations with bronchiectasis, but there are areas that are completely normal. Uh, and that's a very interesting feature it can happen in just a section. It can happen in the whole lung. It can happen in the top and the bottom. And, and, and it, it, it depends on patient to patient. But what is very interesting in this case is, again, we see the dilations, but not a lot of inflammation surrounding in other areas. Now, this is a little bit different. You see, again, the dilations. But here you can also see on the other side some areas of haziness some spots here and there. This is a patient that has an active infection. So it's a little bit different, right? Um, this patient is very symptomatic. May need, we may need to check why or what infection they have. Maybe they have NTM, non-tuberculous mycobacteria. We always have to be mindful about that. Um, so just to show you an example of that. 
know another patient with uh, bronchiectasis. And here in the yellow lines, I'm showing you something extra. They seems to be in like pools of mucus there. That's just pulling there. And so this patient, we definitely need to do something about that to try to mobilize this mucus. Because as I mentioned before, this mucus can also fortunately bring more infection and it just potentiates this vicious cycle. So again, just examples of these dilations. And in this case, uh, you can see this almost air fluid levels, we call, where we see that there's air, but also fluid. In this case, uh, mucus that's kind of stagnant and causing trouble in our patients there. What are the causes of bronchiectasis? Uh, there's a long list of things that can cause bronchiectasis or that we think are associated with bronchiectasis. Some of the most common um, causes are the infectious uh, causes. So let's say you have a very serious pneumonia. So patients that have HIV, we will talk about uh, NTM in a second. Uh, COVID has been associated nowadays with um, the development of that um, bronchiectasis and likely due to active inflammation that unfortunately, again, left these kind of uh, changes that are uh, dilations of the airways that now we describe as bronchiectasis. But there's a host of other diseases out there that have been linked to bronchiectasis, and you can see some of them there. Uh, COPD and asthma, very common diseases that have been linked to the development of um, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, classical for developing uh, bronchiectasis as well. And there's some other theirs, including chronic aspiration and other more rare diseases. GI things, uh, GI uh, diagnosis and, and problems can cause bronchiectasis as well. Reflux, as you know, is very common. A lot of patients have it. And if we have chronic reflux that's severe, it can cause chronic inflammation in the lung and may, <clears throat> may be leading to bronchiectasis as well. And other diseases such as Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and others can lead to um, bronchiectasis, even alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is listed there as the, uh, in, G, in the GI section because it can cause liver problems, but also um, obviously can cause COPD as well. Um, so it's also an important cause of bronchiectasis that we, we have to make sure we rule out. Very interestingly, rheumatological conditions can cause bronchiectasis as well. And when we see a patient that has bronchiectasis, we always ask these questions. Have you had any uh, problems with arthritis, with symptoms like lupus, like dry mouth, dry eyes, to think about like Sjogren's disease. So we do even testing sometimes in the blood to look for those diseases because for reasons that we still don't understand, sometimes these patients also have bronchiectasis. Rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and others can cause this um, um, bronchiectasis as well. And then if your immune system is not working well, either because you have low immune system for low, like um, patients that have low proteins to fight infections, or others like the ciliary dyskinesia where the cilia in, in the lungs are not working well, you can also have bronchiectasis. So when we see a patient with bronchiectasis, you can imagine like we have to be like, oh, what is it? What, what happened? What, what, what happened to this patient that now they have bronchiectasis? And it almost becomes like you, be, you become like a detective. So you have to ask questions, examine the patient, do testing, look at different features if you can find clues that can direct you, orient you to where the cause might be. Unfortunately, and I listed there, that sometimes 30 to 50% of the patients, we don't really cannot figure out after a lot of tests, we cannot figure out. We call that idiopathic. We just don't know. Um, the providers are not smart enough or we don't have the necessary technology just yet to find out. Um, but we're getting better and better and understanding why this may happen. But there's a long list of things that we have to look for. Now, this is the vicious cycle I was mentioning before. Whatever these causes are, all these things that we see, they lead to potentially inflammation in the lung. And that leads to that permanent airway dilation. We talked about the loss of the cilia. And unfortunately, that leads to mucus accumulation, which when you have a lot of mucus accumulate, then that can potentially lead to further infection. I always tell my patients, it's like when you leave a glass of milk outside the fridge, 
it, it's bound to you know get infected and, and and get kind of go bad the same thing happens with the mucus that's why it's so important to to try to mobilize it and unfortunately that infection will bring more inflammation and then the cycle repeats nowadays a lot of the bronchiectasis as experts talk about a vortex meaning that there's multiple directions almost like a storm because we now know that mucus can cause inflammation and potentially that inflammation can lead to more mucus and so there's a lot of air you know movement of arrows here we just for for simplicity we talk about the cycle but it is really far more complicated than that there's multiple things that are happening behind the scenes in our patients so how do we treat these patients we really want to approach as much as possible uh, the inflammation try to treat that that means treating the underlying cause there's future medications that are going to be coming hopefully soon that will target the inflammation we definitely want to um, help with the mucus uh, uh, accumulation so do what we call the airway clearance this, this is extremely important we really want to make sure that we can uh, orient our patients um, to do um, airway clearance uh, exercise continues to be very important breathing exercise there's some specific breathing exercises that patients can do and now we have very sp specific and specialized devices that can help us mobilize um, the the mucus in our patients uh, we have some flutter valves for example that can uh, generate vibration that can uh, transmit to the airways and help our patients expectorate and and for those patients that are not responding to these maneuvers we have now devices vests um, vibratory vests for example that can also kind of vibrate and help our patients um, expectorate which have been very effective in our patients that have uh, bronchiectasis we definitely want to try to treat the infections and this we use with antibiotics and we do close surveillance on infections try to make sure that we don't miss out on anything and particularly we and we'll talk uh, soon about this infections such as ntm which sometimes uh you know we miss because we don't do that close surveillance that we need to do and finally for those patients that are really not responding there are um, options like surgery if the part of the lung that we think has bronchiectasis that's not working anyway what's causing a lot of trouble, either because there's an infection that is very difficult to treat, or perhaps the patient's coughing a lot of blood from that side, despite our best to control the bleeding. Sometimes we ask the surgeons to just take that piece of the lung out, um, and, and that helps the patient and kind of solves the problem. Um, but obviously, if a patient has bronchiectasis everywhere, we cannot do take the whole lung out. Although sometimes patients can have lung transplant due to bronchiectasis, so that's also an option um, uh, if everything fails. So talking a little bit back to causes of bronchiectasis, we'll spend some time about with NTM, as I mentioned before, and a very important cause. Um, it's very important to note that these bacteria can affect any patient. Um, it can affect any patient with bronchiectasis. It can affect any patient really with any lung problems. To uh, Even if they don't have any lung problems, it can be affected. Um, and, and, and there's this concept about the chicken or the egg because we don't know really, and still obviously there's a lot of um, thoughts about this and concepts about this, but maybe it's possible that the... Um, uh, these bacteria, these non-tuberculous mycobacteria, caused the initial insult and then kind of stayed there and then caused, continued to cause that problem until we treat it. But there's also um, uh, a theory that maybe something else caused the, the inflammation and then they are kind of opportunistic and they kind of like to say, oh, this mucus looks phenomenal, so let me come and cause a lot of trouble. Um, so we don't know if the egg or the chicken came first, but what we do know is that these are serious infections and have important implications in our patients with bronchiectasis. So very briefly, we'll talk about uh, what non tuberculosis bacteria are. Uh, these are opportunistic pathogens. They really affect everyone, but particularly they like to affect patients that have underlying lung disease, particularly bronchiectasis. Uh, but also patients that have depressed immune systems. Sometimes that can be 
both patients with bronchitis that have depressed immune system. Typically, we say we kind of acknowledge that these are not transmitted from person to person. Uh, although in cystic fibrosis, there has been some cases where a specific one called mycobacterium abscessus has been trans transmitted from a CF patient to another CF patient. So we have to um, consider that. But for the most part, we say that it, they're not transmitted to pers from person to person. They're found everywhere, particularly in areas that are moist and soil, dust, um, and they create these biofilms that adhere to surfaces in things that are moist. So that's why shower heads, different, um, you know, like saunas or hot tubs are places where they sometimes can be found in higher intensity. So we have to sometimes be careful with our patients with bronchiectasis. Is, do you have a, like a sh big shower head? Do you, do you do like hot tubs and things like that? And, and very interestingly that when we look at the map of where these diseases happen, typically they happen close to areas where there's large bodies of water. So a lot of patients in New York or Florida, kind of like in the in the different parts of South Texas um, and also in California have a higher incidence of, of bronchiectasis with, uh, sorry, of NTM and uh, patients that with bronchiectasis have these infections. So it's something with the water is definitely an important concept. Here are some of the pictures of patients with bronchiectasis and NTM. And again, just to highlight that, remember we had seen some scans before where you could see bronchiectasis by themselves and the rest of the lung looked okay. In this case, you can see a lot of these haziness, cloudiness of the lung. These are patients that have unfortunately advanced um, bacteria, mycobacteria that have affected them on both lungs. Here's another one. You can see those thickened airways with some potentially some mucus in there. And it looks very different. Um, and this are, these are patients that have active disease. These are some of the classical um, mycobacteria that you may hear about it. The most kind of infamous one is MAC, um, but also we see some of the other names that are out there that commonly have been found in patients, both with bronchiectasis and different lung problems. And there's a lot of them, hundred and up to 175 species and maybe more. Um, and the diagnosis really needs to come via uh, culture. We do different testing, but culture is really how we identify it, how uh, if the patient has this. And that's the importance of always thinking, should we, you know, is this a possibility? Then we should definitely test for it. And we test for via sputum. We can do bronchoscopies and other things. And even though it can affect really other organs, the lung is an area that really um, mycobacteria and this non-tuberculous mycobacteria really like to go to. What's the impact of these infections? Unfortunately, they're uh, they're really uh, have dramatic uh, effects. Uh, studies have shown that they decrease lung function, increase respiratory symptoms, affect quality of life, and have been linked to mortality. So, definitely an important disease to consider and to identify at the earlier stages so that we can prevent some of these things from happening. It, they happen, um, as I mentioned before, more frequently in our patients that have bronchiectasis, definitely cystic fibrosis. And now we're seeing a little bit more as we become more aware of the disease in our patients with COPD. And I think that's something that, that we have to uh, consider. Um, these, this is something that we have to have a little bit more suspicion, uh, uh, particularly in those patients that are really not responding or that uh, have unusual uh, symptoms, um, patients that have um, chronic fevers, chronic chills, chronic weight loss, and that we cannot find the reason, we should uh, consider or suspect that they may have um, this bacteria. It doesn't present like a typical pneumonia, it's more insidious and just more uh, chronic, and it, it just demands us for to have a higher degree of suspicion when it comes to to making sure that we send that sputum, that we think about it, and that we can find it in a timely um, timely fashion. So going back to our 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 symptoms of both COPD and bronchiectasis, kind of to talk about 
the, the similarities of, of these diseases, and this includes also NTM, definitely we you see a lot of overlap. And, and you know, it's not surprising that patients with COPD sometimes may have um, a delay in the diagnosis or vice versa when they have bronchiectasis um, because they might actually have a combination of both diseases. We mentioned that COPD could be a cause of bronchiectasis and in someone that's not responding to therapy, we should definitely uh, consider it. So over the past decade or so, there's a lot of interest in potentially these diseases are happening at the same time. I mean, they do share so many symptoms and similarities. It is possible that this may happen. And in fact, some series of patients, um, particularly coming from Spain, large series of patients with COPD, when they looked at their CAT scans, they find actually that a good proportion of them, up to 50%, may have bronchiectasis. There's a lot of patients. And when they combine, when you look at patients that have both diseases, both as both COPD and bronchiectasis, they actually have worse outcomes than either disease alone. So uh, it's something that we're now becoming more interested on because, again, when you have a patient that's not necessarily responding to all the medications that we have for either asthma or COPD or other chronic pulmonary conditions, maybe there's a bronchiectasis component that we're missing. And because we have therapies out there that can use our patients for our patients with bronchiectasis, maybe we can use some of these therapies in these patients as well. So when we are thinking about patients out there that have COPD that are not responding, Potentially, it's reasonable to ask that question, is there something else happening? Um, and could this be bronchiectasis? Um, they share so many similarities that it's at least reasonable to ask the question. The same with TM. If a patient with bronchiectasis is not responding well to therapy or has recurrent symptoms and not doing well, it's very reasonable to look for NTM and actually other infections such as pseudomonas and then at times, maybe, you know, all these things can, can maybe be happening at the same time. Again, I focus a lot on patients that are not responding because maybe there's something that we can do to help them. Um, and now we know that some of these therapies can be effective. Patients that have, for example, uh, therapies in bronchiectasis may be useful in COPD or vice versa. Pa therapies in COPD may be helpful in uh, patients with um, bronchiectasis. So we do have an opportunity to try to help them out. So some of the important things to consider, the diagnosis has to be confirmed. When we're talking about COPD or bronchiectasis, it has to be confirmed either by spirometry in COPD or a CT of the chest. And it's important if someone has shortness of breath, coughing, these chronic respiratory symptoms, to ask that question and say, should we not do this test? Should we not confirm the diagnosis? And importantly, if the diagnosis was confirmed, let's say three years ago, five years ago, four years ago, is it time for us to see what's going on? So should we repeat some of the testing, which I think is very important as well to see if there's been progression of the disease, particularly in those that are not responding well. Um, and infections really should be screened, such as NTM, but also pseudomonas and others. And, and, and that can be done relatively easily with sputum samples. Sometimes the patients may not um, be able to make a lot of sputum, but there's techniques to induce sputum, which is relatively easy and inexpensive. And as I mentioned before, these treatments that we have for these diseases, airway clearance and all these other things that we can do, can be beneficial in both diseases. So it's important to, to consider um, and the diagnosis and just to make sure that we have the most refined information so we can make the better decisions for our patients. I always say to my patients, always ask questions, ask a lot of questions so that we can find out more of what how, what the providers are thinking, what you know what what they're thinking and and how do we can better help. Uh, and I think these questions that I mentioned before, these uh, the ones that I highlighted here, are very important to ask, especially especially if, there, if the symptoms continue. So I'm thinking that is my last slide.
and I'll be happy to take any questions or any comments. And thank you again for, for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, let's get started. We have a, a number of questions in the queue. First one up, are sleep disruption and anxiety symptoms of NTM and bronchiectasis? Good, good. That's a good question. So anxiety per se has not been linked to symptoms of bronchiectasis. Um, there are some um, literature out there with sleep, but it's not closely related to um, what we think of. So there's there's no direct correlation that I'm aware of, at least um, with um, both anxiety and um, and 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 sleep disturbances. I'm trying to think like you know if could this be could there be any other relationship but no not nothing comes to mind at this time um That's and also question. for that person who's asking the question um if you want more information on um you know sleep hygiene and uh, managing anxiety if you go to our youtube channel we've had numerous webinars on this subject led by devin smith from the national jewish health so you can always catch up on that information there Next question, uh, how does spirometry distinguish between COPD and bronchiectasis? Good, good. That's a good question. So um, spirometry will give you a specific parameters that when you look at how much air the patient can blow versus how many much air the patient can blow in the first second, that ratio, that specific ratio, if it's less than 0.7, that's just the the, the 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 ratio that people decided that would be a COPD. Then that's COPD. For spirometry in bronchiectasis, you may actually see uh, very quite often what we would describe as very similar to to um, to COPD findings on obstruction, but sometimes we see different patterns, even what we call restriction, meaning that there's not the classical feature. So you might see that. Um, bronchiectasis patients uh, may have obstruction in general, which may mimic, in fact, findings of, that have COPD, but it's, it can be um, hit or miss with that. The diagnosis of, of bronchiectasis really comes from imaging. Um, really, COPD comes from spirometry. So you, you use a tool for one and a tool for the other. Um, and obviously, sometimes it can be helpful, like a CAT scan can show emphysema, but it's really spirometry what, what makes the diagnosis. Again, the gold standard is spirometry for COPD, and the gold standard for bronchiectasis is CAT scan. Thank you. Okay, next question. Why do I feel short of breath or can't catch my breath when my oximeter registers in the 91 to 95% range? That's a very, very good question. So uh, that's something that, so the, our perception of shortness of breath might be oxygen is just one component. In our patients that have COPD and sometimes our patients that have bronchiectasis, um, because of the dynamics of what's happening with the lungs, there's obstruction, as I mentioned, so airway cannot go through as easily. And then what that leads to accumulation of air inside our chest. Um, we call that hyperinflation. Also, we call that air trapping, meaning that it's almost like we have cannot exhale completely all our air out. So we have that feeling of like you like you cannot exhale completely. That feeling um, can cause shortness of breath. But very interestingly and importantly, when we have hyperinflation, so a lot of air inside our chest because we cannot fully exhale. That affects the way our diaphragm, our muscles that help us breathe, they become kind of like pushed downwards. So they will lose their efficiency. So the chest wall expands, the diaphragms go down. So even though our oxygen level may be okay, we feel that we have to struggle a little bit more to take a deep breath, struggle a little bit more when we exercise and we are um, when we do activities. When we are resting, this hyperinflation or air trapping is not as prominent. But as soon as we start exercising or walking more, 
this becomes definitely more significant and we call that dynamic, meaning that it's more when we have to activity. And that might explain why someone might be short of breath, but the oxygen level and the oximetry shows 95 or 91 percent. It's more of a mechanical thing that causes the breathing. Um, so that's one explanation why you could have normal oxygen levels, but still feel short of breath. Okay, next question. Is there a link between with or is there a link with poorly treated chronic sinusitis? And they didn't specify whether the link is with COPD or bronchiectasis. So I guess maybe yes. you readdress both. Yes, I think so. Most of when we talk about sinusitis, a poorly treated sinusitis, we focus more on the bronchiectasis side. And there's several diseases out there um, that have been have linked bronchiectasis. To sinus disease, particular, particularly um, sinus ciliary dyskinesia, so meaning um, the cilia are not working well, the little, little tiny microscopic hairs that move mucus. So we have these cilia from really the tip of our nose all the way down to our airways, and if that's not working well, patients not only may accumulate mucus in the lungs, but also um, accumulate mucus in the in the sinuses, and that can bring infection. So uh, definitely um, they, there's been links. Uh, so when we see a patient that has bronchitis, quite often we ask a lot of questions about the sinus diseases and quite often we also do a CAT scan of the sinuses as part of the workup, particularly if the patient tells us that there's been issues with congestion to look for uh, this type of sinusitis, uh, pan sinusitis, when it's like the whole all the sinuses are involved but definitely it's on a radar and can guide us uh, one way or the other. Sometimes we do, because of the sinusitis, we do biopsies to try to identify some of these things um, and can help us um, find the, the, the diagnosis of why the patients have um, bronchiectasis. So yeah, it's a very good question. It's a very good question. It's always in a radar when, it, when we see a patient with bronchiectasis, what's happening in the others, you know, the upper airways. Okay. Um, is tuberculosis also a cause of bronchiectasis? Yes. Very good question. Yes. The, the, when we say post-infection, we say, we say post-infective, um, this involves pneumonias, but also tuberculosis. In fact, a lot of patients that have tuberculosis, they have remnants, particularly in the upper lobes, but also sometimes in the lower parts of the lung that looks like scarring and that may mimic, um, uh, you know, bronchiectasis or cavities. And sometimes other non-tuberculous microbacteria may come and, and, and kind of inhabit these spaces, the same with other fungus and other bacteria. So, so yes, that's definitely a cause of, um, of uh, bronchiectasis the post-infective one. Yes, absolutely. A very important one, particularly in the developing uh, countries. Okay. Um, does knowing the cause of bronchiectasis help with knowing what to expect in the progression of the disease? Yes. Very, very good question. Yes, definitely. If we know what what's causing the bronchiectasis, we can first of all, do some interventions potentially, but also can give give prognosis. So for example, if you have bronchiectasis due to alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, we can actually supplement that with medications to, to treat that and give a little bit of prognosis of how that may you know, turn out in the next years or so. Um, sometimes we cannot find the, the the reason, and that's the problem, right? We 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 very frustrating for both patients and providers to say, well, we don't know, but we'll try to keep monitoring. But yes, it, it is helpful. Um, for example, patients that have rheumatoid arthritis, we can treat that. We can treat some of the other diseases, um, and, and then focus on certain things and aspects um, to prevent the complications down the line. So, like sinusitis, we mentioned. Sometimes, um, if there's very 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 bad reflux, there are therapies, even surgeries that can correct this reflux and that prevent the progression of the disease. So finding the reason is, is important for, for prognosis, for interventions, and also for peace of mind. At, at times, the patient just want to know why is it that I have it and, and 
and how can we make it better you know so it very important question yes are con are connective tissue disorders such as Marfan syndrome, Ehlers Danlos syndrome, continue uh, considered to be causes of bronchiectasis? Or I guess are they causing something that would cause yes, yes, yes. So the 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 list of diseases in the connective tissue disease definitely have been linked to um, various uh, forms of pulmonary diseases, including um, bronchiectasis. Again. It's an association. We see it, and 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 we think there's something to it. You know, connective tissue disease, diseases affect sometimes the cartilages, sometimes the smooth muscle, sometimes the connective tissue that sustains the airways. So it would make sense if you have uh, one of these diseases that the connective tissue within the airways may be different, perhaps more susceptible, perhaps just you know more prone to developing inflammation or, or weaker. And, and that's why it may happen that you see sometimes these things, but both Erlen Danos and Marfan have been linked in, I'm, I'm sure I've read some case reports where they showcase um, patients that have also lung problems because of that. It, it's not always, I will say, but it, it, it's something that if someone has shortness of breath and these diseases should be screened for, for sure. Okay. Um, how do you know if you have a depressed immune system? Good. That's a very good question. So um, we we do tests to look for the most common cause, most common uh, deficiencies in the immune system. So we'll check for the proteins in the blood that are helpful to fight infections. We'll also check for how a patient may react to um, vaccine, for example, uh, like an, a pneumococcal vaccine and the pneumonia vaccine. So we check how responsiveness, how what's the responsiveness of the stimuli like a vaccine. We also check um, the, um, the, the type of cells that fight infections um, and the proportion of some of these infect, some of these um, cells. So there's different ways of checking it. We typically it's typically a blood test. So if when someone gets diagnosed with bronchiectasis, we run some of these tests to determine if there's any secondary problems in the way the patients are fight infections. Both either they don't have enough proteins to fight them in the blood, or the, maybe the cells are behaving a little bit different, or or there's other reasons. Um, and, and these are kind of like the initial investigations to find out why the patients may have recurrent infections that are driving this vicious cycle I mentioned before. So blood tests, pretty much. Okay. Um, are you aware of other techniques to test for NTM that do not require culture? Um, they are they're under development, different um, tests where... They are looking at, um, for example, um, exhale breath, a couple of non-invasive techniques. But at this time, the gold standard continues to be a culture because of many things. First of all, we want to identify which type of bacteria it is. So let's say we get a sputum, you do a stain and you see that this, oh, there's a mycobacterium, but I need to figure out what type it is. And some of these um, require culture and molecular testing to determine what type of uh, bacteria they, they, there are. But very importantly, also we can test if they are susceptible to different antibiotics. And, and that's important because that's what we're gonna try to use to treat the infection. So um, as of now, I think the, the gold standard continues to be culture. And, and, and in the future, we may have some other rapid testing, um, but still we need some form of sample to, to do that testing. Um, it's important to mention that um, obviously today we're focusing in, in, in with the lung, but um, it can also be uh, diagnosed in different parts of the body, in the GI tract and others, and if the immune system is really not working well. Um, so biopsies can have been done in, in the GI tract, for example, that can make the diagnosis. 
but uh, as of now, I think it continues to be the gold standard, this, the, the culture, yes. Okay, we have two related questions. The first is, how do you determine what is the primary disease when patients have both bronchiectasis and COPD? And then another one that's very similar, how can you determine if an exacerbation is caused by the bronchiectasis or COPD if the patient has both? Yes, yes, that's a fantastic question and a tough one too. So sometimes when we have these overlapping syndromes, and I already show you that the symptoms are very similar. When we have someone that has exacerbations, we say this person has worsening shortness of breath, worsening sputum production, fevers, worsening purulence. So, so meaning that the, the mucus is more, it's more green than before. All these can happen with both COPD and bronchiectasis. So we are very are stuck with it, are stuck with not knowing what it is. The treatment for our patients with COPD is steroids and antibiotics. The treatment for bronchiectasis exacerbation really focus a lot on, on, um, on, on antibiotics. So nowadays for exacerbations, we do a lot of imaging. If we see new infiltrates, for example, so new hastiness on the x-rays, new hastiness on um on the CAT scan, so suggestion of an infection, then we feel a little bit more inclined of focusing a lot of antibiotics. If you have someone that has bronchiectasis, but there's no new changes in the x-rays, maybe it's a COPD exacerbation. But quite honestly, it's extremely difficult to make that distinction, um, particularly because the overlapping features are so clear, so, so closely uh, related to. So it's a tough question that patients in the when they come to the ER, you're like, hmm, what is this? You know, and then sometimes we have patients that also have quote unquote asthma. So they is it asthma? Is it COPD? Is it bronchiectasis? Is it everything? So quite often the patients will get steroids and antibiotics, and then obviously evaluate them closely. Um, for those that we are a little bit more inclined towards infection, maybe a lot of purulence a lot of uh, fevers, so maybe a culture pops up positive, then we kind of focus a lot on the infection part. But it is a very challenging thing. It's not easy to distinguish. Uh, and some, some people would say it's impossible to distinguish when you see a patient in front of you in the ER. It's a very good question. Uh, and we're still not, not sure what the, the best answer is. How do you treat patients with bronchiectasis and MAI who are drug intolerant and unable to take antibiotics? Yes, that's a very, again, a very important question. Unfortunately, the medications that we have to use for, um, you know, our patients with MAC or other uh, NTMs uh, have to be used for a long time sometimes in combination of many, 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 three or sometimes more antibiotics for a long time. And these are a lot of pills and they have side effects and quite often they are intolerant. Um, we try to use different things. We try to use um, medications initially oral, but nowadays we also have nebulized medications um, that have been used for those patients that are not either not tolerating or have not been successfully treated. And these medications, uh, nebulized medications, nebulized antibiotics are helpful in um, at, uh, offering an alternative for our patients that are intolerant. We always can play a little bit, although it's probably not the best thing, to play a little bit with dosing. So we find ways of maybe doing less dosing or, or trying to always become creative at switching antibiotics and others different classes or antibiotics within a class uh, to try options. But unfortunately, there are times when patients may have liver problems or kidney problems or others that they just um, have to be treated with either instead of three, two antibiotics or instead of, uh, you know, a lower doses. Or sometimes we just leave the patients on longer courses of antibiotics to prevent um, the progression of the disease. And, and sometimes we just can't find it and just we need to do newer therapies. Um, fortunately, with some of the nebulized therapies, the side effect profile is better. 
um, and, and then oral systemic. Um, but obviously, we still need more more medications for for these diseases. It's very challenging. There are some patients that are unfortunately feel terrible with the medications that we give them. Some some of them say, you know, the 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 pills you gave me were actually worse than the actual disease, and and I, I feel terrible. But but that's what we have. We definitely need to do a better job of finding new tools for these patients. At what point would you look for bronchiectasis in a non-responding COPD patient? And how do you quantify non-responding for what length and for what length of time before getting a high-res CAT scan? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So um, we have tools now for COPD, particularly the inhalers I mentioned before, that are very, very good. If you find a patient that has a typical features that are going back and forth to the hospital, that are not responding, that are generating a lot of mucus production, that have um, that really don't feel you don't feel that as a provider you don't feel like they're doing better. I don't think waiting many months is is um, is warranted. I think after a couple of months of therapy and they're still not doing well. We adjust, we modify the, the guidelines, continue to tell us that we have to be kind of dynamic when it comes to inhalers. If this doesn't work, let's try this, let's try nebulize, let's try this and that. But at some point, if there are typical features, meaning non-responding for with good therapies, it's a lot of sputum production, frequent exacerbations, then it's warranted to do a CT of the chest. Not only will it be helpful to to evaluate for other diagnoses um, like bronchiectasis, but also there are times that there's pulmonary fibrosis, there's times that there are other diseases in, in the lung that may also have similar presentations. So it is worthwhile. Um, there's also a push towards a little bit more of using more CAT scan to better, more refined um, uh, characterization of the patient's disease. Uh, and I think that's what we're doing. Um, so to answer your question, I think after three to four months of not really not doing well and really a good trial of different COPD um, medications and the typical features, as I mentioned, then uh, it's reasonable to ask at least, uh, I say, again, ask a lot of questions to our provider and say, hey, um, do you think a CAT scan will be helpful? You know, nowadays we have the lung cancer screening programs, so sometimes that might be a part a good a good time to ask our our providers and say, hey, I got a CAT scan for lung cancer screening. Do you see anything else unusual there, like bronchiectasis, for example? So again, the more questions we ask, the better. Um, but yes, uh, I I don't tend not to wait too much, um, especially those that are going to the hospital frequently. We really don't wait want to wait. Eventually, when they go to the hospital, they will get that CAT scan anyway, but uh, sometimes that doesn't happen. If two siblings in the family both have bronchiectasis, does this mean it's hereditary or coincidence? Yes. When So, it, again, and I really like that question. That's a very, very important question. When we're seeing a patient, uh, a new patient with bronchiectasis, we spend a lot of time talking about family. Uh, and the reason being is there's a lot of diseases out there that are, um, you know, that are happening in the family, heret, genetic. And, and, and so it's important for us to ask um, many questions about this. So first of all, if there's any lung conditions in the family, if there's any problems with fertility in the family, it's also an important aspect. Um, the majority of our, our times, um, we occasionally hear about cousins or distant aunts. Sometimes there's none, but it's important because if there is a family member, particularly a close one, like a brother or a sister, then the, our suspicion for a genetic problem is higher. Um, and, and then just kind of our antennas kind of go, okay, so we need to, maybe to focus a little bit more on certain questions the same with fertility as well, because sometimes we hear, you know, um, that a, a person may or may not have problems with fertility, and that pushes us towards, um, again, genetic problems as well. So yes, when I hear brothers, my first instinct is to think this is not coincidence. 
And this is, we have to explore a genetic predisposition in the family. And, and then we do, when we have another, like a brother, we then really go and say, okay, tell me about your grandfather. Tell me about this. So we do like a, not a family tree per se, although some people would recommend that, but but really explore in more detail the potential connections with the good family. What IV medicines um, are found to be helpful with uh, NTM and particularly with mycobacterium abscesses? Yes, there are a couple of um, IV medications that have been used uh, for our patients that have um, different um, mycobacteria. Um, there's been, um, you know, these medications called aminoglycosides, so amicacin, and a couple of others have been tried. But unfortunately, there, the data behind that, it's a little bit um, not as promising. We still use them, meropenem and others. That these, so these are the names of antibiotics that we have, that people have tried um, in conjunction with the infectious disease doctors. And um, these medications have been successful um, in some patients, but sometimes they're not. M. abscessus is kind of famous for being kind of like a tricky one and uh, and then just kind of like fastidious, I mean, in the sense that it doesn't want to go away. Um, and, and it's been beneficial at times, but um, again, we, we, we have kind of mixed results with some of these medications. Um, it's always good, I always say, and we collaborate a lot with our infectious disease colleagues to have a conference and try to figure out if this has not worked, what are the options we have for them. Um, and and then hoping that that it will be helpful, but it's a tough um a tough uh, uh a tough one. Abscessus is a tough one, and it has also been associated with um having um, poor outcomes as well. Uh, we talked about surgery a little bit, um, and it kind of ties into it. Sometimes when we cannot find the antibiotic, and we feel like it's a localized area of the lung, sometimes we can ask surgeons um i showed you um that picture and uh, you know dr mitchell at national jewish for example is the world leading expert in trying to um resect lungs in patients with bronchiectasis and a lot of these patients actually have m abscessus so as an alternative um and, and some there's some mixed successes there so yeah so we again we need to do a better job of finding options for for these types of of, of uh, infections uh, next question is, how quickly do you typically start your patients on a smart vest or high frequency uh, chest wall oscillation? Although I guess the question could also be, how quickly do you typically start your patients on airway clearance? Yes. So uh, really, uh, as I mentioned before, airway clearance is extremely important. It's like I cannot emphasize that enough. So really, as soon as possible, as soon as we can, we start talking about um, the different modalities. So exercise, as I mentioned before, is ex we that's a must. Sometimes the patients cannot exercise because of many reasons. So then the next step is to try to do some of the um, flutter valves. And if they're not responding to that or they have, um, they find themselves that it's not that effective, sometimes it's because they had frequent exacerbations or or they just feel that they cannot expectorate. Sometimes we see that on CAT scans, like in the CAT scan I showed you where we see air fluid levels, then we really move quickly. We try to do, um, um, you know, not wait too much because waiting might, mm, might cause an exacerbation and a hospitalization. And unfortunately we really, I mean, we don't, that, that's a route we don't want to go. So um, these therapies have been shown to be effective um, are non-invasive and complement quite well to the rest of the therapies that we do for our patients um, in, uh, in with bronchiectasis. We've seen a lot of success in cystic fibrosis, um, but the same we have seen. So to answer the question, I think more directly, we try to really escalate as soon as we can. Sometimes uh, insurance companies will tell us, well, you have to have you tried this or that or, or the other. And so documenting that is important in our, when we're discussing this, that, you know, we tried this, we tried exercises, we tried the, the, the flutter valve, but unfortunately the patients are not feeling well. And, and we think we should move forward um, with using um, 
you know, a therapy like a, like a vest, for example. And, um, and the patients do feel better with it. Uh, and uh, I think it's a, val a valuable tool. It's, a, it's something that we use. And we use a, lo a lot of things at the same time, but that's, that's one important one. Okay, another question about airway clearance. Um, a patient is uh, saying they have mild bronchiectasis and unless they have an infection, they don't bring up sputum, they don't cough. They do nebulize twice a day with albuterol and saline. They occasionally bring up a little bit of, of yellow mucus. Um, they do feel like there's more in there that they can't bring up. Should they do more aggressive airway clearance techniques? Um, they're otherwise relatively healthy and, um, you know, they exercise a lot and don't really have other symptoms. Yes, yes. Um, you know, we always encourage um, all our patients to try to do maximal therapy when it comes to airway clearance. So sometimes it's it's difficult because the, the, the example that you, that the person that asked the question is very classical. You know, I'm doing everything, but I don't cough up a lot. Um, I think we we push hard to make sure that we are on maximal airway clearance as much as we can. Um, sometimes the patients don't feel like uh, they have a significant uh, change in their sputum production, but um, but but like I tell them, maybe it's because you're using this is that you're staying out of the hospital and and not having exacerbations, and they're like. Well, maybe, maybe you're right. So, but I, I we don't want to risk the opposite, which is going to the hospital. I will say, if a patient's going to the hospital quite frequently, then then looking into this more carefully is very important. So, having been more strict, being more compliant with the vest or 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 the or the different nebulizing solutions, um, it remains very important. Um, I think once we maximize either with bronchodilators and all these airway clearance and the patients are still not um, making a lot of mucus, it is possible that there's not a lot of mucus production to start with. They're a little bit on the dry side, if you will. Uh, and that's okay. That's okay. Um, I think what we really don't want to uh, miss is the opposite. Those patients that are going to the hospital and they have mucus in there that we're not, ex ex because we're not doing either good technique or or not compliant or or not using the right uh, airway clearance uh, therapies those patients we definitely don't want to miss but there are some patients that exercise and run every day and, and that's great or some i have some patients that dance a lot um and, and that's fantastic i think that's fantastic and they're like well i don't make a lot of sputum and said well that's good maybe you're swallowing it in the evenings maybe you're not able to cough it up and, and that's fine so bronchiectasis is very heterogeneous meaning that there's patients that make a lot of mucus you know i'm talking about cups and cups of mucus and others that have very dry disease i call it like the dry bronchiectasis um, and that's okay if you're dry that's fine um, but still we have to be vigilant um, and we do that then finally sometimes providers and, and patients may discuss doing a cat scan and seeing okay let me see if there's any pockets of mucus that you can see obstructing some airways. And like I showed you on the CAT scan uh, earlier, if there's some, a lot of mucus accumulation, they're like, hmm, there is in fact some mucus there that we should be able to try to get out of, at least mobilize some of it. And that's a little bit more of an objective evidence of, of a CAT scan, um, like a CAT scan showing us mucus. But I think, you know, that's something that um, has to be taught, uh, kind of, go case by case and when you talk to your providers and say hey this might be an option can i do a cat scan and they might say yes or no um but if they have frequent exacerbations i would definitely consider it okay so there are um a couple of questions that relate to um <clears throat> starting treatment so i'm going to i'm going to give you both of them because i, I think they they are somewhat interrelated so okay. one of them is from a patient who's had bronchiectasis for about six years. They recently um, have had some findings of MAC in their sputum. They're not crazy about the idea of taking an antibiotic. They're doing well with an ex with exercise and nebulizer and, and airway clearance. 
They want to know if you think that's a good approach. And then another question that I think is somewhat related, someone is recently diagnosed and wants to get your thoughts on how quickly should they start treatment. Um, they're apprehensive about side effects, which is understandable. Um, you know, their doctor told them that some patients don't do the treatment because it is a difficult protocol. So can you talk a little bit, I guess, about like, you know, the watchful waiting and, and when when the decision is made to treat? Yes, yes. Uh, again, this is uh, discussed case by case based on the patient's profile, based on the patient's, uh, you know, liver, kidney function, and a bunch of other things that we use. I think um, watchful waiting has been um, done in, at times. Um, and uh, the, the classical example is when we do a sputum sample and let's say MAC comes positive and you do a kind of like, you have to, well, how are you feeling? And they're like, I'm feeling fine. I don't feel any problems. And so there is when we use a lot of our clinical judgment. Are you having fevers, chills? weight loss do you feel like you you know you 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 have an infection with rigors and chills and and that come and go i've lost have you lost a lot of weight um have you you know we looked at lung function and a couple of other things but it's very different than someone that tells me you know i i, I exercise every day and my sputum came back positive as with mac and and the reason this happens is because a lot of centers they are testing periodically the sputum to do screening, just to make sure that we don't miss anything, they send sputum. Uh, and then the, they come back and they're like, okay, what do we do now with it? And the patients are like, I feel fine. So in those patients, I think it's very reasonable to do not only watchful waiting, but also close monitoring, meaning that we have to next visit, definitely repeat another one. I think. And there's criteria that we use, you know, two uh, positive cultures in addition to symptoms, in addition to changes in the imaging, CAT scan or x-ray, that will tell us, you know, maybe we should treat. Definitely we should treat. But there are other times when you get one sputum and it's positive and the patient is completely fine, that we can just do watchful waiting. So it's really case by case. I'll give you an example. Uh, a couple of um, months, I saw a patient that had post-lung transplant, so already immunosuppressed, and a, and a culture came back positive. Um, and we were a little, you know, this is a, a mycobacterium um, that uh, we see here uh, related to primates, actually. Um, and we were like, hmm, maybe it's just a contaminant, maybe it's something else. So sometimes we do watchful waiting but with a caveat that we always want to do close close observation. So your doctor or physician or provider will guide you with regards to what they're seeing based on clinical symptoms, based on changes in the imaging, and based on the frequency of how positive this was. If you have 10 positive sputum, possibly that means that this is a real deal and a real infection versus if you have one, and the next one was negative, what does that mean? Um, so this is a long answer, but again, I think watchful waiting is, can be reasonable in a patient to patient basis, meaning that there's some patients that it might be the best thing. Um, we had some patients that are, are on the older range uh, that side effects may be you know, more significant than the actual disease. And at that time, that's also reasonable to do watchful waiting. Um, and, and there's really no right answer. Um, how easy to start treat, treat how quickly to start treatment. Once we made that decision, we try to treat as quickly as possible. If we find those features, let's say two cultures that are positive in the sputum, or we did a bronchoscopy and the culture came back positive and the patient has all the constellation of symptoms with findings on the x-rays or cat scans suggestive of active disease, then we have to treat. Uh, and there has to be a reason why not to, meaning side effects or the patient's like, I don't want to, let me just wait. I always make him promise, okay, we're going to wait, but are you going to come back to see me soon? Yes. So some middle ground there. Um, and if something changes, they can always, you know, 
reach out and say something is changing. I feel bad. I don't feel well. Let's go ahead and and consider the therapy. Uh, I don't know if that answered the questions, but it, it, it's it's a real life problem that we have that these medications are just tough. And sometimes there's three medications uh, we have to take for sometimes more than a year. You know, so it's 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 a tough tough road. Yeah, I think that was a great answer. It's uh, somebody once described it as both art and science. So I think <laughs> yes, it's a great way that's correct. That's correct. Um, somebody's asking, how can primary ciliary dyskinesia, which um, <clears throat> for anybody who's not familiar with it, it's a genetic disease affecting ciliary movement in the lungs and other places. How can PCD, primary ciliary dyskinesia, be a cause of bronchiectasis yet not be qualifying diagnosis for the treatment of bronchiectasis? For example, for an airway clearance device, such as, you know, a vest or, or something else. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. So that's a very good question uh, because, so there are patients that have uh, primary ciliary that may have milder forms of the disease i will say it will be tricky to find one because the, the reason we find them is because they have some form of manifestation right although there's some infertility that has been linked to it um i think the indication based on the um, on on what some of the insurance companies use for coverage is they do want that actual bronchiectasis diagnosis. It doesn't really matter if it came from uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia or if it came from alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency or from previous post-infective, let's say TB, as we mentioned before. They really, they don't care. They just wanna make sure that the diagnosis of bronchiectasis, which is really the anatomical reason why the airway clearance would be needed, um, that's that's the reason I think that they're using. But I agree, it's a very it's a very important question. If if the patients have a, a reason for this, I mean the diagnosis, the primary diagnosis is this, why cannot automatically be a qualifier? Um I, I'm guessing that's the answer. I'm not sure, to be honest with you, the 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 politics behind it. Uh, yeah. but but it, it is it is what the insurance companies have used is that diagnosis of bronchiectasis clearly seen on a CAT scan. So they don't care why. They just want to make sure that this is the reason. Yeah, so um, ins insurance companies look for something called an ICD code. And mm -hmm. that's basically a code that's assigned to a specific diagnosis. So the more, I guess the moral of the story is definitely make sure that your doctor is using the ICD code for bronchiectasis. For exactly. That, thank you so much for that clarity. That's a very important clarif clarifying point. Yes, uh, sometimes the doctors, you know, they just say, you know, ciliary dyskinesia, and they don't really document in detail that bronchiectasis with that ICD-10 code that Amy was mentioning, because that's what the insurance companies will pick up in the progress notes. Okay, um, really good question here. How has the shift from the vicious circle to the vicious vortex changed how you think about bronchiectasis, and has it changed how you treat it? Yeah, that's a that's okay. That's a sophisticated question. Uh, yeah, no, that's a very good question. So, um, I think what has happened now is um, we understand that the, the really the, the the vicious cycle is a very simplistic way of looking at it, particularly with regards to inflammation. We now know that there's a lot of things that are happening behind the scenes. We understand now that there's different subtypes of inflammation. Uh, we call that endotypes or sometimes phenotypes. What does that mean? That means that we have cells that are predominantly causing the inflammation. The very, very infamously, I guess, is the neutrophil. So that's a cell that fights infection, but also can cause inflammation and destruction in the tissue. Um, we now also know that there's other cells called the eosinophils, which typically have been linked to allergies that have been um, also linked to bronchiectasis. In fact, that's some of the research I do with our bronchiectasis registry. So in the vortex now, we, we know that this inflammation can be um, teased out better and that sometimes these, these um, things can drive 
and different conditions. And for example, the inflammation can lead to mucus directly. Not, not only that there is accumulation from anatomical reasons, but actually eosinophils, for example, may stimulate the, the plant to produce mucus. And then there's more mucus. The neutrophils may stimulate through different pathways um, how cells may um, attract other uh, or fight other infections. So it becomes a mesh of arrows over for over the place. And so what this new way of looking at it has enhanced um, targeting therapies now that actually will target the neutrophil inflammation, potentially target the eosinophilic inflammation. We have medications that have been developed that are very close to being um, approved, hopefully, by the FDA that will target some of this inflammation. We have existing therapies that target the inflammation as well that we use for asthma in particular that have been uh, very effective. And perhaps we can use it in our patients with bronchiectasis. So there's definitely a lot of um, interconnection um, we want to disrupt that vicious cycle with, as I mentioned, bringing the inflammation, the airways and things. But it seems like when we just do the disruptions, we can actually do far reaching, um, important things for our patients. So it, it just changes a little bit what we used to use, you know, in the past, which is just move the mucus and then prevent, treat the underlying cause and kind of prevent that and treat the infection. Now we are really more sophisticated identifying subtypes of patients with bronchiectasis with different types of inflammation. And we hope that very soon we'll be able to uh, target these uh, more elegantly. Okay, so we are past 5.30 and there's still a number of questions. I'm going to jump around a little bit um, to some questions um, and, and we will try to get to all of them, but I'm going to jump around a little bit. Uh, how can we expel more breath if we have hyperinflation or air trapping? Good question. So uh, what we try to do in those cases is we try to, as much as possible, maximize our bronchodilators, meaning that we use the, the most effective or most, I mean, we try to use the most um, comprehensive way of opening the airways so that when the patient wanna, wants to exhale or is doing the exhalation, they're able to exhale all the air out. So now for, for specifically for COPD, we now understand that using two classes of bronchodilators at the same time, the what we call the long-acting beta agonist and the long-acting muscarinic antagonists, this combination of inhalers together give us the best chance of opening of opening the lung the airways so that we can exhale maximum. So now we have that combination that we can use. Um, so again, that that's the way we could optimize that breathing. Okay. Um, can bronchiectasis advance even though you are actively doing treatment as a result with NTM? And is there any way to figure out what kind of prognosis there might be with that? Yes, yes, yes. That's a that's a that's a very good question. Unfortunately, there are times uh, we've seen that even our best efforts with all the airway clearance and with all these antibiotics and even screening for recurrent infections, um, sometimes we've seen that um, our patients have, you know, they deteriorate over time. We know now that pseudomonas in particular um, has been linked to poor prognosis. So when we see someone that has pseudomonas, it also is just like NTM, it, it, it's, a, it's a red flag, uh, an alarm. And, and the guidelines, particularly in, the, in Europe, but now in the United States, we, we, we do measures to try to eradicate, for example, that pseudomonas with antibiotics. That's one of the most common things that can kind of bring, tell us a little bit about the prognosis of patients. So the monas, uh, are not fun. They cause a lot of inflammation in the lungs and likely will cause the progression of worsening lung function, worsening exacerbations, so more frequent exacerbations and have been linked to mortality as well. So that's one of the most important risk factors, I think, for um for bronchiectasis. Those patients that are frequently going to the hospital, that's also a sign of uh, poor prognosis. Um, 
we have some therapies that we can use to prevent these things. Um, sometimes chronic antibiotic use, using antibiotics every day, um, and others. And hopefully these new medications I described earlier may potentially be helpful. Uh, but I would say pseudomonas and frequent exacerbations are one of the most, uh, NTM as well, are one of the uh, highest um, risk factors for progression of the disease. Uh, and then in these patients require most clo uh, more close monitoring, and sometimes a very aggressive therapies. Is it imperative to drink only purified water and purified ice? I guess with respect to exposure. Yeah, that good, good, good. Yes. That, so, so far we haven't had any great success about preventing the disease because, as I mentioned before, the NTM appears to be everywhere, really, in the environment. I will say that, you know, we still advise that try to prevent expo unnecessary exposures. So I have some of my patients they get upset with me, but they, they, they like a lot of gardening, for example, and they like the roses and they like their plants and their pots and stuff. I think probably if you have bronchiectasis, you shouldn't be like playing around or, or, or working too much with soil and, and, and water and gardens. I don't think that's probably the best thing. Um, and, and the same with shower heads that are specialized or hot tubs in some of these environments. Uh, I think those are reasonable precautions. I think uh, purified water uh, systems um, have been um, have been recommended at times in patients that have immunosuppressed states. Um, it's not universally recommended. I don't think it will hurt you to um, to use purified water, but I don't think it's a mandatory thing. Um, and um and 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 on, unless there's something specific in the community or in the house, um that's that's you know patient to patient, um but I don't think it's a universal recommendation. I think just being cautious um, with exposure to dust in wet environments, and as I mentioned before, other of these activities, it, it's a reasonable thing to do, um and you may consider doing purified water, but it's not paramount or absolutely necessary. I think uh, reasonable changes are are fine, um, but not dramatic and drastic. And as I mentioned, there's it is just everywhere that you would have to be in a pretty much in a bubble not to be exposed to them. So um, just not overdoing it with the with the gardening, I think it's a, it's a good starting point. We have a couple of questions related to sputum samples, so I'm going to sort of combine them. Um, yes. One person's uh, saying that her doctor only does one sputum sample, so is there a better time of day to get that sample? Um, and then the another question is, if your sputum has tested positive for NTM, is it important to know the number of colonies? Um, good, good question. So, um, you know, some some of some are very picky about how to um, provide the sputums. They prefer not to, for example, do it in the morning before even brushing their teeth. Um, our our respiratory therapist, um, um, she's very very specific and particular about this. Um, so she'll say it can only be a morning sputum. It can only be um, uh, before you brush your teeth, and you have to deliver it. Uh, the same day, you can put it in the fridge for a little bit, but they have to be done as soon as possible and processed as soon as possible. Uh, I am a little bit more flexible because sometimes we just want to get sputum so that we can make sure that, you know, the best, at least we get some. Um, so I'm a little bit more flexible, but that's supposedly the best time to, to do it. Um, the number of colonies and some of these things um have been uh, looked at before i think in our at least from our practice we focus on if there's presence or not presence of um and then what type of mycobacterium it is and if there's patterns of different antibiotic resistance um more than the actual number of colonies that are forming and they just report us you know the patient has mycobacterium abscessus or mycobacterium Avium complex like MAC, um, so so that's something to to 
that that at least we do, and then the infectious disease doctors may um, may want more information. Um, but that's what we kind of like um, focus on a lot. Um, we ask our patients sometimes to give us a sample once a year, sometimes once every six months, and they're high risk or we think they're very symptomatic really on every visit. And this varies from center to center. Um, I know, for example, uh, National Jewish, Mayo Clinic, they do it on every visit. Um, some other centers do it at least every six months, some every every year. Um, but it's a discussion that uh, can be done patient to patient. Uh, okay. Um, are all of these conditions susceptible to aspergillus? Um, and there's there is a difference, I guess, between colonization as an, an infection and when when would you treat something like aspergillus? Yeah. Well, very good question. So aspergillus is a is as a fungus that occasionally we do find in a wide range of settings. It can be very can cause a lot of trouble. Uh, particularly in our patients that have an immune system, problems in the immune system. But it can also be found in the environment and can also be what we call a contaminant. So um, in a similar to similar to uh, NTM, we use the context of, uh, of what the patients are feeling, what are the symptoms, um, what are the underlying abnormalities in the imaging, and uh, when we see in a CAT scan, for example, advanced bronchiectasis, a lot of inflammation, sometimes we see cavities, sometimes we see even cavities full of fungus, we call those fungus balls that are like a ball of fungus that's growing in a cavity within the lung and that has special signs and features, then, then that's what we call invasive aspergillosis. What does that mean? That means that the tissue is actually being invaded by the fungus, that the fungus is causing destruction. And sometimes we have we can confirm that doing biopsies uh, or with this the specific features I mentioned, either from the patient clinically or from the imaging. And based on that, we can then decide if we want to treat that versus if the we was because we've seen it, we have a patient that let's say, for example, has a positive culture for aspergillus but the cat scan is completely normal. So then we, what are we treating, right? So we're not, and the patient feels completely fine. So that that's a different spectrum. That's something we call colonization or incidental findings. And so in those cases, we do not treat um, because the treatment entails, you know, an antifungal therapy for many months sometimes. So if we are gonna commit a patient to it, it better, you know, be a, uh, the reason may better be supported by some form of objective evidence that the aspergillus is causing invasion. Now, I will make a very brief disclaimer that if a patient has a significant immunosuppression or immunosuppressed state, meaning they have advanced, I don't know, HIV or advanced uh, or lung transplant or other types of conditions like cancers that are being treated like leukemias or lymphomas, then you might need to treat because you cannot risk because they might not mount a significant response. So you might be kind of like say, well, but just be safe and treat. Um, but it again depends on patient to patient. Um, and we also have patients that have um, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. These are patients that have uh, asthma-like features. So a lot of wheezing, a lot of um, MA present with bronchiectasis too. Um, and so in those patients, sometimes we also treat not only with antifungal therapies, but also with steroids and sometimes for a long time uh, to bring that inflammation. Uh, and in this case, it's not an infection per se, but a high susceptibility or high sensitivity to the aspergillus that makes causes a lot of inflammation in the lungs. It's not an infection per se, it's just being very exquisitely sensitive to the aspergillus. So you see it's a wide spectrum from contaminant to being super allergic to it, to have really a um, disease that's causing a lot of, you know, destruction, invasiveness of that fungus, aspergillus. Okay. Um, we have some other questions regarding, um, you know, different diseases and comorbidities. Um, here's a good one. Does bronchiectasis give you an elevated ANA titer without having another connective tissue disease? 
Ah, uh, okay, good, good. So part of our workup when we do, so the ANA tire is um, it's a, a tool, that, a blood test that we use to screen for autoimmune diseases, um, and particularly rheumatological conditions such as lupus, for example. Um, so occasionally, so, okay, so when we see a patient with bronchiectasis that may have some features of autoimmune conditions, let's say rashes that are not fully explained or joint pains that are not fully explained, we would do send some of these testing. But bronchiectasis per se wouldn't make the test positive. Something else that may be linked to bronchiectasis is what's driving the positivity of that test. So for example, lupus, if ANA is positive and, and because of lupus, not because of bronchiectasis, the inflammation that's derived from the lupus, which is an inflammation of the whole body in different parts of the body, including the lung, can lead to bronchiectasis, but it, it, it's not something that we would see by itself. Now, ANA sometimes would be, this is, this is a very common problem that happens with ANA, but others, because we're kind of suspicious about an autoimmune condition. Sometimes we send a panel looking for Sjogren's disease, looking for rheumatoid arthritis, looking for lupus and some of these other diseases. And in those cases, sometimes the patient's test came back, come back positive. Let's say a rheumatoid factor. And then when we ask our patients again, but, but you don't have any joint pains, right? No, I'm okay. No joint pains, no rheumatoid arthritis, but the rheumatoid factor is positive. It, it just suggests that maybe it's an autoimmune rheumatological reason why you have bronchiectasis or why the patient has bronchiectasis. And sometimes this may happen before the arthritis. So it just kind of points towards um, that we should have to be on the lookout for potentially rheumatological symptoms. The rheumatologists get a little bit upset with us because we do the test and then they become positive and they're like, now what do we do with them, right? But um, there are times where we kind of tie the dots and say, oh, by the way, yes, I've been having a lot of joint pains. Yes, and I have bronchiectasis. Maybe it's rheumatoid arthritis that's driving this. And there's therapies, as you know, for patients with these types of conditions um, that we should consider. Uh, but yeah, that's a that's a that's a fascinating question because, as I mentioned before, we we become like detectives, right? So we start really looking for whatever we can to try to explain why the patients have bronchiectasis, and sometimes we uncover things that we um, then what do we do next with this information? So yeah, it's a fantastic question. Well, here we have another one that's a little bit out of left field. So we have a patient who's asking about the trajectory of COPD to bronchiectasis to NTM. They were diagnosed with diffuse idiopathic pulmonary neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia or DIPNEC. Um, where does that fall sort of in the link of, of these three it's COPD to bronchiectasis to NTM? Yeah, that that's a, that, yeah. So in, in that regards, we, we, we know now that uh, NTM can affect really patients that have changes in the lung. I mentioned it can happen on everyone, but it likes to go where the lungs architecture has changed. And sometimes in patients with nip neck, I mean, like in this patient particularly, um, depending on the extent of the disease, the, there's changes in the structure of, of, of the airways. There might be changes in the in, in some other um, the component of the architecture, and that may predispose patients. So we see it in patients that may not necessarily have the classical features of COPD or bronchiectasis, but they have an underlying uh, lung disease. It can happen in patients that have, um, you know, uh, we talked about cystic fibrosis, but other diseases um, that the norm, the lung is not normal, and that there may be some problem with um, the immune system or sometimes with accumulation of mucus or combination of both so you can you can experience that um, we always have a high degree of vigilance if a patient has a chronic lung condition I mean we have many different ones uh, and there's abnormalities that don't fit for example that haziness that we talked about or um, 
chronic production of mucus or fevers or chills or weight loss that are not otherwise unexplained, then it's, then we have to test. Um, but that not necessarily means that you are going to have COPD or that you may have bronchiectasis. NTM can happen in those patients. And as long as there's vigilance, things should be okay. Um, the, the, the bin diagram of having COPD, bronchiectasis, and NTM the, is not a progression on one direction or the other. It, it's just to highlight that these symptoms can happen in the three of the diseases. And, and it's important to just to be vigilant and ask questions about, could I have this or may not, or someone may have overlooked this. And it's important to act if we think that I'm not responding the way I was supposed to be responding to the medications that they gave me. Um, that's the, the the idea of that. Um, it's not necessarily that it goes one way or the other, but, but um, it can happen, as I mentioned to you uh, before, in anyone that has structural pulmonary abnormalities. Um, and definitely bronchiectasis is the, is the most common that we see, but it can happen in others. So just vigilance is what I would say. Okay, um, somebody is say, asking that uh, they have asthma, emphysema, bronchiectasis, and pulmonary hypertension. Um, they, and they're asking how can they tell which one is bothering them? They find it quite challenging. Yes, yes, that's a yeah. I get another a great question. Then something that we see in our clinic very often. So asthma and COPD can coexist, and in that spectrum, they may have a little bit of bronchiectasis here. When these diseases advance, um, sometimes there's low oxygen levels, which may lead to chronic changes in the vessels of the airways. Um, and this may lead to what we call the pulmonary hypertension. So elevated blood pressure in, in the vessels inside the lung. And it is hard to tease out sometimes what is driving what. Um, we have a lot of questions about asthma, COPD overlap, because how do we know it's asthma or COPD? And then you add the bronchiectasis and then you add the pulmonary hypertension, you become, it becomes really complicated. Um, I think we do it systematically. We try to um, treat the conditions as much as we can, meaning that we focus on each of them and try to optimize with the tools and therapies that we have and based on that, we we can uh, determine. So, for example, in this in this case, with someone that has four pulmonary conditions at the same time, um, imaging is helpful, right? If we have a let's say a lot of bronchiectasis everywhere, likely that's the reason why the patient may have shortness of breath. Um, versus if there's the bronchiectasis here and there, and that's why I, I always say ask questions, right? Show me my scan. Show me how much bronchiectasis I have. Is it mild, moderate? Is it severe? Right? So that can give you an idea. The other thing that's very important is the lung function, right? We want to assess what's the degree of lung function um, that we have. So the lung function, we talked today about blowing air, the spirometry, right? And if the when we do that, we see that the numbers are very low then that's likely asthma or COPD is the driver of the symptoms. There's another um, test when we do the pulmonary function test that's called DLCO. That's the diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide. That sometimes can help us tease out how efficient your lungs are. And if you have, let's say, COPD, your lungs won't be as efficient um, because of that emphasis. If you have asthma, that number will be high because... The problem is not necessarily the, the, the unit, the alveoli, that's the problem. And you can use that again to tease out. So we used imaging. We can use to evaluate bronchiectasis. We can also use pulmonary function testing, particularly some of these other numbers, to figure out what else. And then also we have the echocardiogram, a tool that we can use to evaluate how bad the pulmonary hypertension is. And that can also tell us if the patient has severe, mild, or moderate pulmonary hypertension. And, and with this information, we can decide what is the driver. And sometimes we just start to treat different things uh, and see how the patients respond. 
we call that therapeutic trials, meaning that we say, okay, we're going to focus on, on COPD and asthma. We're going to give you bronchodilators. We're going to do, and then we'll see how you respond. And then the patient will come back and say, you know, I feel wonderful. Okay, maybe that's what's driving the disease. Or the opposite, let's say we do it and nothing works. Then, okay, we're going to try a, a vest, for example. So we're going to do a vest and better airway clearance. And they come back, you know what? That that really made a huge and huge impact. Or if there's pulmonary hypertension, there's now a lot of medications for that. So if we, you know, we feel like that's what's driving it based on echo and cardiac catheterisms and other things, and we treat that, then we can actually um, say, okay, well, this is what's driving it. It's hard. You mentioned four, but sometimes the patients may have even other ones, right? They may have scarring with a little bit of fibrosis here. They may have sleep apnea. They may have uh, other um, other things like vocal cord dysfunction at the same time. And, and then the list, you know, okay, you have seven diagnoses of that may affect your shortness of breath. They have bad anemia and they are, you know, a little bit overweight. So they have obesity that may affect and they have deconditioning. So only you have 10 things. So uh, our job as providers try to help as much as we can is to tease out these things. Um, by trying different testing and also by trying different medications and hoping for the best because it's um, it's a tough, it's a tough, uh, it's, it's tough, but that doesn't mean that we cannot make it happen. Um, again, I always encourage everyone to ask questions and questions and questions so that we can um, understand better what's happening. It's a very good question. I like that one. Speaking of questions, we have uh, four more and we are coming up on the two hour mark. So I'm gonna do these last four questions and uh, close the queue to more questions. So the okay. first one is um, a follow up on the patient who was asking about a high oximeter reading and still being short of breath. They mm -hmm. clarified they do have MAC lung disease um, and they've had it for over a decade and they have had their lower left lobe removed. So I don't know if that makes a difference. Yes. So um, I mean, again, it, it would I I will uh, have to see like a couple of other things, but definitely um, in someone that has had previous surgery, the lung expansion is not the same, and and it would have to be how we have to see how the the dynamics of the chest wall and the uh, and the lungs and how what was the extent of the resection to see. Sometimes we do see patients that um, have a bit of deconditioning, meaning that they're with time they're not as active as they were supposed to be, uh, and that might explain sometimes the shortness of breath. Sometimes the um, surgeries in the chest can affect the diaphragm. It can affect. Um, it can leave a little bit of scarring, or the way the the lung exp the the lung or the chest wall expands are a little bit uh, different. Um, so these are some of the reasons why may someone may have kind of that feeling of shortness of breath or tightness or incapacity after they had um, uh, surgery. Um, so that could explain things. And it will be interesting to see the rest of the lung, if there's bronchiectasis is there as well, to explain why someone might be still kind of short of breath. Um, sometimes advanced MAC can leave scarring that can, again, prevent the full expansion. Um, sometimes patients may have um, what we call atelectasis, which is like wrinkling of the lung in certain areas um, that can happen. So um, it, it's a it's a good question to, to kind of tease out um, all the reasons. I think the answer most likely is uh, related to the previous surgery um, that may have... Um, cause problems, but I, I wish I would love to examine and obviously see the scan and, and get a little bit more history, of course, to provide a more definitive answer. But I think it I'm very likely tied to the previous surgery and, and the active uh, previous MAC disease that the patient had. All right. Next question. Have you seen a rise in headaches that cause pressure buildup when you're coughing or bending over? And they're asking specifically, have you seen that more in the last few years? Does it maybe have something to do with COVID or is that just something that happens more with coughing? So the headaches? Yeah. So a rise in headaches that cause pressure. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes. When yes. you're coughing yes. or bending over. So headaches have been, um, 
you know, patients that have chronic cough, unfortunately, often complain of headaches as well. Um, and and I not necessarily seen a rise over the past years on on headaches. We always ask about headaches because excuse me, patients with sleep apnea, which we always screen for, um, that's one of the questions that we ask them. Have you had? Do you have headaches, particularly in the morning? And our patients will complain about chronic headaches sometimes with the cough, cough, cough a lot. But I have not seen necessarily an increase in the incidence of uh, headaches, at least in my practice. And I do ask that question very often. So, but I have not seen a, a, a rise that at least per se, from a subjective, um, we would have to look and see specifically in our, in our complaints and our questionnaires, but I have not seen a dramatic rise, no. Okay, um, next up is often I cough up blood in my sputum. Should I not nebulize for a few days? Uh, good question. So uh, sometimes patients with bronchiectasis, they um, may have some blood tinged sputum and, and that can sometimes be seen when they have active infections or they are not um, or they or they have some problems with uh, coagulation in the blood. In this case, in particular, when you see blood all the time uh, and no major symptoms or no symptoms of an active infection, then I think it's worthwhile mentioning, obviously, that to um, to the provider, your provider, to make sure that 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 has been looked into a little bit more closely. Yes, bronchiectasis is, is a very common cause of of this hemoptysis, of coughing up with blood. But um, it should be carefully screened for other things that may cause coughing with blood, including active infections, active NTM, active TB, and a malignancy cancer as well can has been linked to to these types of things. So um, again, if your provider has um, not addressed this with either repeat imaging, sometimes we actually even do bronchoscopy to look into the airways, to, so to look inside the lungs. Um, if that has been done, which I'm thinking that's the case, then um, sometimes easing down on the um, on some of the airways clearing therapies can be beneficial. And this I'm extrapolating with from the cystic fibrosis uh, patients. When we have a patient that's admitted with hemoptysis, we kind of put a little pause on some of the airway clearance um, therapies, um, hypertonic saline, for example, which is a concentrated saline that we use to move or help move some of the mucus, we can put it on hold for a couple of days until that goes away. And I wonder if that's the experience that the patient has that's asking the question has felt like after you stop a couple of days, kind of subsides. And then as you start again, then it comes back. And, and that might be that there might be a little bit of irritation from that. Um, so as long as the provider has the provider has actually uh, is aware of and and doesn't think it's something very serious, then stopping the therapy should be reasonable for a couple of days. But I would definitely ask questions about this to, to the provider. Should we be worried? And how often and should we do imaging or other testing just to make sure there's nothing else hiding? Okay, our 50th and last question is from a patient being treated for uh, NTM mycobacterium obsessus. Um, they want to know what do they do if the antibiotic treatments are not working um, and how soon after they start IV treatments should they get another chest x-ray, well, chest CT, I guess, and sputum sample? Good, good question. So um, the, it's the IV antibiotics and the combination of IV antibiotics I strongly suggest that if a patient has not respond, it's not responding to antibiotics for M abscesses, to seek expert consultation. Um, I'm I'm a pulmonologist and I obviously treat a lot of patients with uh, COPD, bronchiectasis, and asthma. Um, but there are centers that have specialized in these types of very difficult to treat. Um, um, uh, mycobacterium abscesses. So, if the medication, so I would definitely seek expert opinion with the a pulmonologist that has experience with bronchiectasis, but also an infectious disease physician, um, to kind of have what we would describe as a consensus meeting or 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 a little bit of a roundtable discussion. 
to look at options. There's always options out there for uh, or new therapies that have been explored and new regimens that could be tested. So that's something important to consider. Uh, there's always something else. So there's different centers across the, the, the country that, that are able to um, receive patients and sometimes virtual consultations with the physicians. So I think that's an important uh, resource to consider. Um, definitely um, after therapy started, we do want to see some, uh, we want to retest. We don't have to retest immediately but we have to give some weeks. Some people like to wait six to eight weeks before retesting. Some people wait a little bit longer, three months. Um, particularly if the patients are not doing well or still having symptoms, then it can be tested sooner. And the same with a CAT scan. Most um, most people would recommend doing a CAT scan within a time frame of um, three to four months, sometimes sooner, depending on the nature of the disease. And again, an option that's always out there if everything has failed, including multiple regimens of IV medications is if there's a limited disease, let's say the right lower lung, the right lower part of the lung, could this be something that could be resected? And, and it's important to, to know that because some centers don't are not aware that this is done for some patients. So they, why would you resect the lung of an infection? Yeah, yeah, just like you would you know, amputate a leg that's, you know, very infected to preserve the rest of the body, you would do the same for um, these diseases, these infections that are not responding to everything that we've tried. Um, so that's always an option. So I would say seek definitely expert opinions when the patients are not being uh, responded, there's no response, and then also consider other alternative measures, including surgery. Okay. Well, guess what, everybody? We got through all the questions. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Maselli again. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful presentation, very informative. Um, everybody was just thrilled with it. And, um, you know, 50 questions, a two-hour presentation. <laughs> that was fantastic. We really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, everybody, don't forget to check us out online, NTM Info and the COPD Foundation. We will have information on our social media all month long about COPD Awareness Month. And also, don't forget to mark your calendars. Every July 1st is uh, bron World Bronchiectasis Day, and every August 4th is World NTM Day. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you again, and have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.